Good afternoon and welcome to uh, another GEMCAP Academy. It is my pleasure to welcome a dear friend of the Academy, but also a dear friend of mine, uh, Etilia Vedaziano, um, who's joining us today from Florida. Is that correct? Although it is. Everything looks, everything looks very Italian behind you, but then that's, not, that's not a surprise. Etilia, how are you today? Uh, I'm good, and uh, I am, of course, a follower of the the academy, and it feels great to be to have made it to this this episode. So thank you for having me here. Thank you. Now, thanks very much for sparing us your time. Now, obviously, what we want to talk about today is a subject which has been has been going on for quite some time now. Since since the great British people decided to vote for Brexit, we've been living on borrowed time as far as the ability to distribute funds, one from the UK and into other parts of the world, which to, historically has not really taken a huge amount, but more importantly, from our point of view, distributing funds from the offshore markets of Dublin and Luxembourg into the UK, which actually are significant um, fund flows. Now, there's, we've had 10 bit permission regime. We've been living with that now for a number of years. Um, there's obviously an update. Uh, Celia, do you want to just update us as where we are as with the changes or the announcement? Yes. So I, I think I wanted to uh, first uh, have you think about the the irony of this, right? So um, in the in the prelude to Brexit, I think that equivalence was one of the the most Google terms, right? And was always seen as something that UK market participants would be more about and be concerned uh, about its. Uh, extent compared to the to the passporting and the the headlines of uh, a few weeks ago is instead that the UK has deemed equivalent the uh, European Union and its users, right? So the the Brits beat the the Europeans at, the, at their own game in a way, uh, and I I also think that. Um, not as many were concerned with with the fact that the, the the retail fund market in the UK had been virtually closed uh, since Brexit to uh, the the offshore funds that that you mentioned, right? Uh, and now we have uh, a good solid step in the in the right direction with the overseas fund regime kicking in sometime in in 2026 uh, um i think that um there is always this idea that when we change something and we feel uncomfortable we can go back to to a status quo uh, unfortunately uh, in this case um the, the status quo is a little bit different uh, because um, offshore firms uh, willing to 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 get once again their, their foot into the the UK market will have to do more things uh, than they were required to do uh, before, and I think that this is where I really liked your your wisdom because in a way or another, GEMCAP is positioned very well to, mm -hmm. to take advantage of, uh, of these changes. But at the same time, the, the game is also changing with, uh, with sustainability and with the UK having its own regime on um, sustainable disclosures and, and the labels as well. Yeah, so let's just clarify this. So we've now got the announcement of equivalence for yes. um, distribution. What will that actually entail? Will it, you know, does the equivalence mean equivalence, or are we having to do something beyond what we've already currently been doing? You just touched on that a moment ago. Yeah, th th there is more to do, and I think that the we have sufficient time, right? So let's say we have uh, nearly two years before this happens. But the message is that managers should get prepared. Um, it's like, you know, the, the, if we look at the, if we zoom in, uh, there is an application to be prepared uh, electronically on the, the website of the, the FCA, uh, but the FCA will want to know from the very outset the, the lay of the land, all the pieces of the of the puzzle. And one of the things that wasn't required necessarily before was to have an entity that approved uh, the um, financial promotions for uh, for use its funds. Um, it is interesting because the, the FCA, when announcing the, the consultation on the OFR, says that the usage before 
were considered as their own authorized uh, person or firm, if you like. Uh, and, and now it's um, never too early to start thinking what firm could be named to uh, as the approver of the financial promotions for uh, usage which will be marketed under the, the OFR, right? Mm -hmm. And so what is interesting is that some of the, the big players, including yourself, um, they have um, a UK authorized entity in the group of, of entities, and this entity will be able to approve financial promotions uh, yeah. for all the others who, who don't have this this type of setup they will have to reach out to third party firms which will uh, charge a premium to to be involved um, i just wanted to to mention that um, recently there is a concurrent uh, type of uh, uh, exercise for authorized firms that want to become approvers of financial promotions of third party. And there were also recently cases of, um, before the, 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 the courts where people were fined for having approved uh, misleading or financial promotion which, which ended up, up to be misleading. And so yeah. it's something that managers should really give some, uh, some thought. Yeah, we obviously at GemCap, we have the GemCap UK business, which is a, a financial promotion sign off business and also does facilities agents. So, if anybody wants to know, um, get in touch. So, so we're clear. So, we've got this equivalence moving forward. We've got two years to get ready for it. There's going to be a lot more uh, online, which is uh, to be um, grateful for. Are there any other issues that we need to address in the meantime? We touched on the SFDR and SDR. Obviously, ESG products have become very popular in recent years, although they seem to have drifted a little bit in, in recent times. Do you see uh, any challenges for the industry to uh, to understand the difference between the SFDR and the SDR on the one letter? Yeah, I, I think before we get into that, there is another point on the, the, the OFR, which I wanted to, to touch very briefly on. And it's something that we discussed already when, when we met a few, few times ago. Um, there is, uh, the UK environment is um, a little bit more sophisticated, in my view, for what concerns the, the investor protection, right? And so mm -hmm. the, the, the optical difference between an offshore Irish fund or Luxembourg fund and a UK fund will be that the, the UK fund has the, the ability to offer the, the, the ombudsman, the financial ombudsman, and the financial services compensation scheme. Now, now, uh, I know that you did mention that there is always a way to um, sue the, the management company. Yeah, or, well, the, the, the board is responsible and has you know, PI uh, behind it to protect that. So he, a corporate structure would get, therefore get sued by the investors if something went wrong. That's where it falls. But yeah, sorry, I just I interrupted you there. No, no but basically the, the reality is that and, and I think that this goes back to the point of, of the challenges. Even though the, the, the market in the, the UK retail fund market is, is opened in, in principle, um, there is, uh, in my view, uh, there will be a, a, an aesthetic or optical difference between the offshore funds and the UK funds, whereby the offshore fund on the cover will have to state that the, the ombudsman is not available and that the financial services compensation scheme is not available either. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in the in the, the other disclosure, this information will trickle down and will be expanded. And so managers, they really have to think uh, how can they make uh, UK, in my view, UK investors uh, more comfortable about the, the possibility of the of a remedy, right? Which, in my way, uh, is in my way of thinking, is not is not always going to be um, comparing apples for apples because basically mm -hmm. uh, the the financial service compensation scheme is more immediate than suing someone and doesn't require sure. any any but, type but, of fees. I, I, are you suggesting, therefore, that uh, that Europe gets a financial compensation scheme in place? 
I was because, thinking about that, yeah. Yeah, I, I, that would make sense. I can understand how that would work. And and obviously, there's a levy that's applied. I mean, to be fair, and in full disclosure, there are very few funds that blow up. Most of the financial compensation scheme payouts in the last 25 years or so have been when a wealth, not wealth manager or a financial intermediary has done something wrong. That's where the, 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 uh, the payments have been made. Obviously, in recent times, we've had the Woodford scandal um, and that's the, the financial compensation scheme has been uh, applied there. But that is quite a rare. I think we had another one with ARC, uh, Arch Crew rather, Arch Crew some years ago. But they are very, very rare. So, but I think you're right. It would make sense for Europe to adopt a financial compensation scheme. The challenge would be that would Dublin, if Dublin did it, would Luxembourg have to do it? If Luxembourg did it, would, would Dublin do it? And what about the, all the other jurisdictions? You've got you know, Gibraltar, you've got your Malta, you've got your Cyprus, you've got you know, all the, the domestic markets producing their own products. So would they do that? That yeah, should be a challenge. Yeah. If they tackle it at European level, it, it might be much easier. But I, I think that the, the ombudsman is not such of a foreign concept in Europe. But as you would agree with me, that there is nothing that comes even close to the financial compensation scheme. Uh, and this is a sign, in my view, that the, the UK market is pays more attention to the keyword of investor protection on this point than, than the others. Yeah, I agree. Let's go back, if we may, to the SFDR and SDR about the understanding of that, because it is, you know, it is quite. A, you know, I was just talking to a manager earlier on today and trying to explain to them about the demands that's put upon fund managers on the SFDR and whether or not he wanted to go down that particular route. Where, where do you see the differences between the UK SDR and the uh, offshore uh, equivalent? I, I, I'll tell you the the truth. I uh, I don't claim myself to be to be an expert in SFDR, but I I can see the the, um, the impact on on distribution, and this is where I got curious. I think that I I understood better the the European framework as I looked at the at the British one, right? And so um, in the in Europe they have looked at the at the disclosure requirement. Uh, based on the type of product. So if you are an Article 8, you have to disclose to a certain extent. If you are an Article 9, nine even more. Uh, if you are an Article 6, not a lot. And Article yeah. 6 is the, the take of Americans, in, in my experience. I'm sure that, that that's the yeah. same that you see. Yeah. Um, the, the, yes, uh, the UK SDR uh, is an expression of the, the, the British pragmatism, in, in my view, because they're looking at the, the disclosure from the perspective of the consumer or the, the market, right? And this is why they introduce labels, yeah. which are uh, envisaged in the second version of SFDR in, uh, in, in Europe. And this is uh, also the reason why within the same infrastructure of SDR, they decided to tackle the, the marketing issue of the use of ESG terms in fund names from the very outset. I couldn't really understand why Europe has done it in a piecemeal way until I saw how the, the, the Brits did it. Uh, and so I think that the... This is the, the, the issue, Stuart. I'm sure that, I'm sure that you see it. Um, the, one, why the, the overseas fund regime uh, has been pushed down to 2026? That's because the, the, the main issue becomes, will, be, uh, will the UK want to extend the label to offshore funds as well, if they meet the requirements or not. And so this is the, the, the leverage also, I, I guess, at the political level. And if we go back to the to the distribution, in my view, uh, this is another uh, or optical difference, because when an investor is going to look at the, at the two uh, funds, the offshore and uh, the, the UK, the offshore on, on a, in addition to the disclaimer for what concerns the ombudsman and the financial service compensation compensation scheme, we'll have to say that that fund does not qualify for a, for a UK label. And so in, in my view, if the direction is towards a, a fund market where the, the consumer has to decide uh, independently without an advisor, there is a bias towards... Uh, a UK yeah. national fund 
Yeah, there team. will be. Yeah, there will, yeah, I could see that. I, I, I could see that. But uh, majority of funds, I'm pleased to say, go through professional advisors. That they go to the intermediated channel, be it a wealth manager. And so, so that's the direct consumer in the UK is uh, what's a dying breed, but there's not many of them. There's you know a few thousand. And yes, they will have a bias towards that. Um, and they would be picked up if those who are into the, go to the intermediate channel, if something went wrong, would be picked up by the compensation scheme of their, by their wealth manager. So let's just touch on, if we may, on um, a couple of other distribution issues. Obviously, distribution is something I, I spend far too much time talking about. Um, reverse solicitation. Now, reverse solicitation is one of those things that I never really quite fully understand. And I'm, I actually don't believe it ever actually happens, but you know, that's just me being a cynic. Do you see reverse solicitation um, changing in any way or has it changed? What's your view on it as a, as a, as a concept? Let me tell you, I uh, was thinking of the earlier this morning of the conversation we were supposed to have, and uh, I had uh, a thought about it, right? So the, Reverse solicitation, I, I hear from this side of the Atlantic, many people saying, oh, yes, uh, for Europe, I will do reverse solicitation, right? And this is where I want either to change subject or go somewhere else, right? Uh, I think that reverse, I would like to, to hear more people saying we have been approached by the, 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 the investor or the, the client, uh, spontaneously, right? Now, uh, I um, have this theory whereby reverse solicitation is uh, is a freedom. It's like, you know, it's a privilege for uh, an investor to decide to, to, to do business with a firm that is possibly not authorized in its own country, right? And that's because they, they, they heard of it, they did a, a good marketing type of, of effort, right? And so, again, making an, a, a parallel with uh, with GEMCAP, even though it's not about selling, uh, yeah. you have been over the, the past couple of years um, showing your commitment to, to ESG, right? And so this is a yeah. way to, to talk about uh, your brand. Uh, I yeah. see uh, that reverse solicitation, many people said that with the pre-marketing was, was dead, right? I think that the, the pre-marketing killed the, the reverse solicitation as disguised sale practice, right? Yeah. So the idea that I approach a manager and then I, I have them sign a letter or a clause, I think that basically that is, um, you know, past and history, it, it doesn't really, it's not as solid as an argument anymore. Where yeah. I see that reverse solicitation has, uh, has still room and is alive um, is when I look at the, at the fact that the, the marketing has been defined, the pre-marketing uh, has been defined as well. ESMA came out also with these guidelines on the, the marketing communication. So the, the, uh, the anti-marketing, which is the, 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 the reverse solicitation, has been confined into a specific place where it's, it's still alive. I, uh, I, if you read the, the ESMA guidelines, you'll see that there is a list of things that are not considered uh, marketing. Some of them, of course, will never help you to, to raise your, uh, your profile, but some others, the ability of talking about uh, a specific market in general or the ability to, to talk about the capabilities of, of someone yeah. uh, is in line with the fact that we live in, a, in, a, in an economy of attention. And interestingly, I see uh, that the managers who are doing the, the best job at that, using different platforms on social media, sending the message across in, in a more commercial way, if you like, are the ones who don't need the, the reverse solicitation because they have all the licenses in the world, right? Yeah. And so probably it's still alive, but it needs some thoughts and some money spent on it as well. Yeah, right? it's, it's it's interesting because when we work with managers, you know, as, as you know, Tilly, we work one of them as a manco, we're very proud of our distribution heritage. And so I will often sit down with the manager and say, well, where do you want to market? What's your target market? You know, is the strategy f good for, for the market you want to target? 
invariably, particularly US mines will say, we want to do Europe. And you go, well, no, no, you can't just do the whole of Europe, 26 countries, blah, blah, blah. Just get a rifle shot approach, a very narrow focus. Now, what happens there now, I find, is that if you focus on one particular market, let's let's say Switzerland. I, mean, I know it's not probably technically about part of Europe, but let's say Switzerland. It, it sort of it sort of sends messages out to the, the surrounding markets. So you suddenly get a, a reverse solicitation from Italy, from yeah. Germany, from France. It, it just happens. It permeates out because you're you're on the city wire roadshow in Geneva, and so people from Italy and France and so on go into that market. So you do get it. So there's a benefit from that. Obviously, fund registration is very expensive if you do the whole market. So again, we're always advising people just stick to one or two core markets. And if you haven't got a SFDR of eight or nine, don't bother with the Nordics because you, you're going to struggle. Although, you know, that, that, there is some there is some leeway there. So it is very important when it comes to cross-border uh, working to ensure that you're you've got the registration in place and if you're going to rely on reverse solicitation make sure you meet the guidelines and we'll share the guidelines uh later on actually i think at the end of this we'll, we'll post that but as far as other de developments with regard to the uk going back into the uk now do you see any other developments in the next couple of years that fund managers should be looking out for as well to from a distribution point of view well, I think that the, the the main issue, in my view, well, more than an issue is that the the the, the, the known unknown is whether uh, the the labels in the in the UK will be extensible also to the to to offshore funds. And I think that the, the from that point, this is not going to be an issue only for the UK market because it's an issue already for for the French market, as you know. Better yeah. than me, right? So yeah. we're talking with uh, we're helping a client with France, um, and they have a, a Luxembourg fund that is Impact, right? And they have it in in their yeah. name. And so by the time they'll they'll face the French market, they will have to disclaim. And and French do it in a more French way. They say this claim is disproportionate. Yeah. Vis a vis the expectation of the French regulator. That's because they will never fit the label that there is in the um, in in france the sri label which requires that the 90 percent of more of the assets being uh, sustainable and a specific composition of the portfolio so i think that that sustainability so to, to go back to to where we started the, the uk uh, was part of the union when the the rule book on financial services was built right so from 2008 yep. to, to 2020 the difference now is on the sustainability where they took a completely different path and possibly on the on the digital assets uh, as well mm. uh, but otherwise it made no sense in my view if not political sense to not for europe not to grant the equivalence to the, the uk would have made things much easier for uh, for everyone and so this is why the uk giving equivalence to europe is a uh, a step, a right step in the right direction, but it doesn't mean going back to a status quo as before. That's true. Now you just touched on digital assets there and another aspect. We, we'll, we'll have another session, maybe talk about tokenization and digital assets, yeah. and we'll bring that to um, our viewers. So, but for now, uh, Celia, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, we look forward to uh, continuing the conversation, but in the meantime, uh, take care and we'll speak to you soon. All the best. Ciao, Stuart. Thank you. Talk soon.